Hi folks, this is Jason Moore here with MTGOAcademy.com and I'd like to welcome you to the latest installment of do 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 dime a dozen 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 This deck sucks. Or does it? I guess you'll have to wait and see when we play the matches. But before we get to the matches, I'd like to introduce you to Koldotha Jeskai. Why is it called Koldotha Jeskai? Well, it plays the card Koldotha Rebirth, and there is a general artifact and metalcraft theme to the deck, and Koldotha, as you see in the flavor text of Great Furnace here, is a, a product of the Mirrodin block, which is an artifact themed block, not unlike Kaladesh, which is coming very, very soon. It's called Jeskai because it plays the colors white, blue, and red. And that is the color combination known as Jeskai. So pretty straightforward there. This deck comes from a lineage of mid-range, attrition, late-game, controlling type strategies in the classic popper format and that lineage includes other decks like boros and azorius kitty popper domain and uh, pretty much any mid middle of the road core sky fisher i'm going to bounce permanence and replay them for value type of strategy this falls firmly in line with those type of decks and what they want to do which is what pretty much any mid-range or control deck wants to do, which is survive stage one, build advantages in stage two, and create a stage three endgame that wins the duel. Now this deck does that in a number of different ways, but the, the framework of the deck is to play these colorless artifacts, Icker Wellspring, Prophetic Prism, Bounce them with Glint Hawk and Core Sky Fisher, replay them to draw additional cards, and then combine artifact lands with uh, various other artifacts in the deck that can be used, have a, ver a variety of uses, and then finish the opponents off with attacks in the air, attacks with Koldotha Rebirth tokens, and a flurry of burn spells, including Lightning Bolt and the souped up metal crafted galvanic blast. I'm playing a few weird cards in my list. I'm playing Thraven Inspector, who not only works well with Core Sky Fisher, not only draws us extra cards, but also adds artifacts to our board to lend to metal craft and help Glint Hawk and all that. I'm also playing Flare Husk, which is another body and an equipment that can make our guys win fights in the skies and I'm trying out Sanctum Gargoyle these guys return artifacts from our graveyard and as you can probably guess we're playing two which means there is the potential to ping pong between the two of them you play the first one the first one dies you play the second one the second one gets back the first one the second one dies you replay the first one first one gets back the second one rinse wash repeat and the thing that makes this a Jeskai deck is we're also playing Mull Drifter, one of the great flyers in the format. Probably the, well, and you know, Peregrine Drake is around, so <laughs> I don't want to just take it for granted all the way, but this is probably the best flyer. Uh, I mean, it's arguable at this point, I guess we can say. But uh, this one works pretty well with Core Sky Fisher also. The deck is fairly straightforward. Lots of removal, Journey to Nowhere, Firebolt, I already mentioned these burn spells. Lots of ways to draw cards and lots of evasive attacking and blocking going on in addition to just a slight splash of equipment here. So the sideboard I kind of threw together very quickly. Hydroblast and Pyroblast, these are going to come pretty standard in most blue-red decks. I've got a split of Graveyard Hate, depending on what we think might be the most useful. And also, they're both artifacts, so that never hurts. I've got Ancient Grudge, because we are powering it up uh, with Prophetic Prism here. 
this is going to be mostly against Affinity. Leave No Trace is going to be mostly against Hexproof. Circle is going to be mostly against Burn. We also are playing Patrician Scorn, so it's actually a 2-3 split, or sorry, a 2-1 split of Leave No Trace and Patrician Scorn, just because we're not playing a ton of white spells. I mean, uh, we're, we're playing a decent amount, 12 to 15 against Hexproof. We you know we might be cutting journeys. So casting this for free is not going to be as common as just casting this for two. And then Serrated Arrow is another value artifact we can play in the deck. Snipe some uh, enemy creatures, obviously, with this. It's going to be good against small weenie-type strategies. Now, my initial assertion that this deck sucks. <laughs> well, let's find out if that's actually true or not, because it's time to battle. Hi folks, we're here with our first round in the popper two-man queues. I believe we're on the draw, so we're just waiting on the opponent to decide if they want to play first. And we are playing Koldotha Jeskai today. So we'll see how it goes. And it looks like... Um, Looks like our opponent's familiar with who we are. So we'll see how it goes there. We do have a keepable hand. It's going to be a lot of bouncing of Icker Well Spring, but that is what the deck wants to do. So we'll go ahead and keep. Our opponent keeps seven. And we'll just begin. Looks like we're playing against an aggressive deck. Hexproof, no less. So game one is probably all but lost here. We're going to lead on the tapped land and this is kinda what the format is about right now Peregrine Drake has pushed so many decks into being very proactive very fast and very unforgiving and in the case of decks like Hexproof and Elves which are both I would say considerably popular particularly in events like the two-man queues you're gonna lose a lot of game ones if you're not playing a similar type of strategy so I think our best chance I mean we could just play a core sky fisher but I think our best chance right now is to add to our metal craft and probably play the Icker wellspring because there's a chance we draw Koldotha rebirth and that's gonna be a better target for the wellspring also we have all of our colors so I don't think the prism is really adding much to our game plan here. Yeah, so we're getting trampled to bits. I don't really think there's a lot we can do. Um, our best bet is probably to draw a card with the prism and then play the glint hawk. This might get us a chance to hit Koldotha Rebirth off of this prism. We did not. So let's just go ahead and play Glint Hawk, and we'll bounce the Prophetic Prism. So this is a okay. This Peregrine Drake era, I just I w have just been talking about. It's a big part of why Koldotha Jeskai is not as popular as it once was. Koldotha Jeskai was probably a top five, top six popper deck before Peregrine Drake. But now, because of all the things I just said. We're going to have to block here. We really have no chance of winning this game, so... Um, yeah, we'll just block. We go to four, I believe. And uh, probably going to lose after that. So, I think we'll just play a couple dudes. And we'll hope that the opponent misses their attack step. So, maybe play Skyfisher, bounce the cove, play... I mean, it doesn't really matter play Glint Hawk Bounce the Wellspring. Uh, missing the lands. Land drops kind of sucks. We'll just play the Prism again. Uh, we're not really going to get there, so doesn't really matter what we do. I'll just go ahead and bounce the Prism once more and play the Tranquil Cove. And the only way we don't lose is by uh, him missing his attack step, so I'm already uh, preparing for this, but it 
So he made the attack, and we're going to lose game one. Hopefully our sideboarding will help us in game two, but we don't have a ton for this matchup. We just have uh, a handful of um, really pointed hate cards. So I think Sanctum Gargoyle will be too slow for this matchup. And probably want to remove some journeys, maybe all of them. Or Narlet is the only reason we would want the other journeys. We definitely want these two hate cards, or these three hate cards rather. Patrician Scorn is destroying all enchantments. Leave No Trace is destroying all enchantments with the same color. Um, I think we want... Okay, we don't actually have Lone Missionary in the sideboard. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I built this deck even basically just now. So I can't remember exactly what was there. Relic will keep Rancors away. And it's a it's a fast cycle that we can just run through. And we could keep one journey just to keep um, Aura Narlet in check. I think it's still probably better than a 4-mana Flyer. Though the 4-mana Flyer also turns on Patrician Scorn. There's not a lot of our artifacts go into the graveyard in this particular matchup, so I'll just keep the one contingency to Aura Narlid, and we'll submit like this. Now we're really going to need to have hate cards either in the opening hand or drawn. I'm not going to mulligan too aggressively to find them, but it's just going to be another factor we want to consider. We have an okay amount of draw, but it's very slow draw. So I think that's going to play into this quite a bit. Meaning it's it's not going to be great for us. Time is of the essence, especially with those turn one hexproof threats coming down. So I believe the opponent is still sideboarding. We cut our Sanctum Gargoyles and two Journey to Nowheres, basically for the Leave No Traces and the Patrician Scorn and a Relic, I believe. And there's a Leave No Trace right there along with uh, some Cantrips, so I think we can keep this hand. And as long as the opponent's hand is not insane, uh, I think we should be able to keep him at bay. I mean, I'm expecting this to hit at least three enchantments this game. We'll see. There's no guarantee of that, but... Okay, so he's going to see the Leave No Trace. That's a big factor, because that's going to actually let him play around the uh, the card itself to a decent degree. Though, the thing with Hexproof is, he might actually have a hand that doesn't play around the Leave No Trace all that well. So we'll just have to wait and see. We, we have to keep note of these lands. We know that he knows about these lands and these spells. So let's say we draw a Prophetic Prism or a Great Furnace next turn. We're going to play neither of those. So we just go straight for this. That gets rid of two cards that he knows about. He doesn't know about the Gal Blast. He does not know about the second Leave No Trace, which I think will flatten him outright. Because he's got to kind of slowly deal with these cards now. And uh, this is going to be pretty big, the fact that we have a second one. We're one artifact shy of Metalcraft, and of course we're going to be bouncing it to our hand soon. A lot of the lines of play in this deck are very um, focused and intuitive and straightforward, but that leaves less options, at least the way I play it. I don't like to miss my land drops or bounce lands back to my hand, so a lot of the time I'll delay playing a core Skyfisher in order to uh, make sure I secure that land drop for the turn. Things like that. So we're playing the Skyfisher, bouncing the Wellspring, and playing the Windscarred Crag here. We do not have access to blue in, in our hand. So we have to keep note of that. So he knows about Leave No Trace, Wellspring, and Windscarred Crag, but that's it. He does not know about the second Leave No Trace, the Mountain, or the Galv Blast. So good for us. And now he may be playing an Aura Narlid. Nope, Commune with the Gods. A creature enchantment. So, Forest went down, Growth went down, Cloak went down. He, he took the Boggle. 
So we can just dismiss all of that. So we want to play the Wellspring instead of the Prism right now. And I may want to leave up Leave No Trace. I mean, he's not going to be able to one-shot me. Even if he had Land, Ethereal Armor, Ancestral Mask, I don't think he'd be able to one-shot me. Ethereal Armor would be plus one, two, three, four, five, five. Ancestral Mask is for each other enchantment, so it would be seven, nine, eleven, or something like that. So, while he does know about the Wind Scarred Crag here, I think I still want to achieve Metalcraft and draw an extra card. And I think I'm fine attacking. And Leave No Trace can happen later. I feel comfortable leaving shields down for a turn and giving him this information. Just to see a card deeper in my deck, get some damage down. We now have a Flare Husk. Not not insane here. So I think we absolutely want to play Windsguard Crag next turn, even if we draw an untapped land. So he's going Ethereal Armor. And is he going to do anything else? Because I can kind of pace that by blocking with Flare Husk and kind of force him to do more uh, committing. Okay, he's just going in for four. Okay, so I'm happy attacking. I'm going to play the Flare Husk as a chump blocker. And I'm going to leave up Windscard Crag here. This is a bit of a cat and mouse game, but uh, things are going to progress in sort of a strange way pretty soon. So now the only card that he still knows we have is one copy of Leave No Trace. Everything else is kind of a mystery to him. Okay, never mind. Now he knows about both. And he knows about the lands as well and the Galv Blast. He's at 13. He's taken 4 damage from the probes. It's basically a free block. Okay, Rancor goes on. And he's just going to attack like that. I think maybe I'll take the 7. Because I could kill the armor. Actually, I can just kill the armor and I can block. Uh, so let's declare it as a blocker first. will kill the armor. He loses first strike and toughness boosting. And uh, his slippery boggle should die. So let's try that. And nothing on our side dies. Just the ethereal armor. So we take two if this goes through. It's looking like it will. We still have Metal Craft for Galv Blast, so we can do that whenever we want. Okay. They trade. I think it's possible he didn't know that was going to happen, but he might also just have another creature. Nope. Okay, so this is pretty straightforward. We equip, we attack, and we play Swift Water Cliffs. And uh, this looks pretty good. We've got eight points of burn, so that's a kill ne by next turn. And this was pretty, pretty strong win for us, actually. I mean, if it if it is in fact a win, um, the only thing that could happen here is prismatic strands. So I think I'll throw one Galv blast at his face right now. Uh oh, something's happening. Oh, okay. So I guess we'll just let that resolve, and we're not going to leave no trace or anything. We'll just wait, especially now that we have Mold Drifter, so we'll hard cast it. Great draw, of course, as usual. Good to see you, old friend. It's been a while since I played a Mold Drifter. And we have Lethal Burn in hand. I'm just going to equip the Flare Husk. Um, I don't think there's any reason we'll need to leave up anything. Again, we have Lethal Burn in hand, so game should be over.
prismatic strands being the kind of the only thing that that's a factor here. Um, so I'll go for the attack. What I'm going to do is play around prismatic strands to the best of my ability. So I'm going to burn him once this turn. Uh, I think he only saw the Galv Blasts. So I'll burn him once this turn. And I'll stop him on his upkeep to try and get around the other potential strands. I think he saw the Blast. So I'm going to just fire the other one. I think the Bolt came in later. Okay, so that was very sweet. I really enjoyed that. I don't think we want to change any of our sideboarding. I think that's about it. He had a very creature light draw, which benefited us considerably. We're going to be on the draw this time, which is good because we get, an ex get to see an extra card. The tempo is going to be a little uh, rough, but we're going to get it that much more of a shot at hitting our sideboard, which I think our sideboard's pretty potent in this matchup. And I think his deck is a little more prone to mulligans. He has not mulliganed yet, so that's that's very interesting. But we'll see what what becomes of uh, game three. This this honestly could go either way at this point. This matchup is very interesting. Like I said, hexproof I think highly favored game one. Though we have enough burn and evasive creatures to at times snipe games away from them. I think more often than not they're favored to win game one. And then game two and three is going to really depend on sideboard, how much, how the sideboards are constructed, how much of the sideboards get seen, and on draws, how much of each mix of question to answer ratio gets drawn. So if I draw my answer to Orinarlin, which is Journey to Nowhere, and he never plays one. I have a dead card in hand. If he draws more Aura Narlids than I have answers to, then I also have sort of a, a dead strategy going. If he draws a bunch of creatures but not enough auras to make them bigger than mine, he's kind of drawing dead. Or not drawing dead, but he's, he's in a, a no-win situation. So it's just endless scenarios of that kind of thing. So we have an interesting hand here. It's a one lander on the draw. Our opponent actually kept seven for the third time. We can also cycle away the Relic of Progenitus. But there's, I mean, these will fix our colors and have us going for a while. There's nothing really great about having the Journey to Nowhere either. So I think six cards on the draw with the Scry will be slightly better. There's, there, there's a lot of reasons you could keep this hand. But because Bull and Journey effectively do nothing if he doesn't have Aura Narlet, I think I'm going to mulligan to six. We do, and we can definitely keep this hand, even though we still have a Journey to Nowhere. Galvanic Blast, I don't think I want. Um, and we'll F8, turn off his... Yeah, there we go. So he's got, got a great start. We'll go ahead and pass. And he might just be too fast for us to deal with, but we might also draw some some awesome stuff. It looks like he's going for Ethereal Armor real early on. Nope, he doesn't have anything yet. He's going to have a 3-mana aura, and that's going to be a problem. Okay, so we're clearly just playing Prism here. We do have Metal Craft. I don't know if that will matter. Okay. So again, I think our... Basically, our lines are kind of figured out at this point, where we're either playing Skyfisher and Crag or Prophetic Prism and Crag. Things will kind of open up after that. If he gets a really strong aura going, a uh, set of auras, I'm going to have to just draw and draw. So I'll have to play Prism, then Evoke Mold Drifter, and really just have to try and find my sideboard, because I don't think Skyfisher is going to do much for us. If he just plays Ancestral Mask here, that it's not incredible incredibly fast as a clock but it is a clock so he's got perfect information 
Let's see what happens. He's down to four cards. He's going to throw something down. I think we just have to draw. I don't think Skyfisher does anything. So, yeah, Armadillo Cloak. Nope. Growth, and then Ancestral Mass. Yes, yeah, so we really have to draw. Well, we've got three great cards <laughs> for the situation. And maybe he has Ethereal. Oh, okay. He Maybe he has Ethereal Armor. That'll be a 4-4. I think it'll be a 4-4. White, green. Oh, he's just going to blow up our lands. All right, that is sufficiently annoying. That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Fortunately for us, we do find lands to follow it up, and I don't think we're going to be too far behind because of that, but uh, it, it all really is going to come down to finding sideboard stuff. Okay, that's not too bad up front. We, it's not the fastest clock. We have enough time to deal with it. I think I'll just play Sky Fisher to get a blocker down. That's also a blocker, though. Thraven Inspector. Um, Thraven Inspector is also a blocker. Sky Fisher gets me a draw next turn. If I miss a land drop, Thraven Inspector... I can, I can bounce the land... Which might be good. Hmm. Or I could just draw off the prophetic prism. Uh, I can also build up to maybe blocking his 3-3. So I'll just play the Thraven Inspector. I think there's enough reasons to do it. And there's no reason to leave up Lightning Bolt. We do have some time here. He might actually be able to one-shot me with like an Ancestral Mask. Three, five, seven. On top of the three is ten. So maybe not. And this guy has Trample. Yeah, so what is that? It's only nine. Okay, so if he just attacks, I'll just save myself uh, a hit here. I don't think there's any, th any reason to save my guy. And we kind of need something here. So I think I just have to play Skyfisher and hope I'm not dead. That is what it's looking like. And I think I'll just bounce the Windscarred Crag to get the life, because we already have a prism to draw. And uh, it's looking kind of ugly. It's looking kind of ugly. Yep, that's going to do it. Whatever this is. Yeah, it's Xaxes. All right, so this is this is looking like uh, kind of what I said. How things can really go either way, and the the tempo change or the answer to question ratio can swing in anybody's favor. So he's gonna get us for Xaxes here, and we're gonna take a dive one game to two in round one, and hopefully do some more. All right, and thanks to our opponent for being so positive and for supporting the content 
that's much appreciated and it's always great to see some etiquette some sportsmanship and some friendly conduct here on mtgo let's go ahead and get to round number two thanks guys all right guys we're back and we're actually facing the same opponent i'm not sure if they're playing the same deck but if we are we're getting just a straight clinic on the matchup and how to understand it so here this is really weird because we're missing one of our colors actually two of our colors and I think it would be a closer keep if we didn't know the <laughs> if we didn't know what the opponent was playing but I think we have an idea of what they're playing so which is hexproof, very unforgiving, and we don't want to be um, falling behind against that. So I think I will mulligan. And this hand at least has our colors, so I'm going to keep it. We're going to pitch any lands and try and get maybe like a Koldotha Reaper. The Flare Husk is at least a blocker. It makes our clock a little bit faster. Opponent mulligans to five, and we're off to the races here. So... We'll see how this goes. We at least have a bit of a curve that we can work with. It's all tapped lands, but what are you going to do? Uh, so same matchup. Opponent mulligan to five and may or may not have a nice mix of creatures and auras. But either way, we're going to just get it rolling here. If we can steal a game one, I would, I would uh, really enjoy our chances at that point. We have a lot of dead cards game one. That's another reason that uh, we're not too good in uh, the first game. We have a lot of cards that just don't interact with a hexproof creature at all, which he appears to have. So let's see here. Um, he kind of whiffed on that. He took the Heliod's Pilgrim, which he'll be able to cast. I'm going to just leave my guy back. We can kill the Pilgrim, we can evoke the Mole Drifter. Yeah, I'm just going to leave my guy back for now. The Flare Husk is kind of a free block, and it's a screen for the uh, the Scout. Pilgrim is going to be tough. It's going to really be tough. So just how tough it's going to be it has yet to be seen. Maybe we can beat down in the air with gargoyles and do something, but I imagine he's getting an armor. No, he's getting a mask. And could just slam gargoyle here and loop them. That, that'll provide us with infinite blockers, basically. So I think that's a decent play. The problem will arise if uh, we end up facing any type of trample which we're going to hope to fade here at least for a time in fact both of these guys will successfully block nope he's got the trample definitely got the trample so I think because this guy's going to be so huge we may just have to start well we can't race a, uh, an armadillo cloak so I think we're just evoking here not sure if that's absolutely optimal, but okay. Do have a Thraven Inspector? It's not quite five points, but and we have no attacks. Yeah, there's not a lot we can do from this position. Ancestral Mask is what seven seven. We just have to somehow get enough guys on the table to block, which is basically impossible. I don't actually think we have anything to win this game. Now that he has the trample, the hexproof, three, five, six. So we just have to hope he never draws another guy. We could just block and keep blocking, but I don't think that actually does anything for us. Two, three, 
four five six yeah this is just a losing proposition this is I mean this is comical how how lame this game plan is we do have metal craft now it's not gonna matter but four five six yeah I don't think we can really do anything maybe that was the wrong option this guy just gets bigger and bigger anyway yeah not a lot that can happen here just have to try and draw sideboard cards game one is is pretty terrible alright I think I'm just gonna concede I'll just block with something go to one Yep. And GG. Okay, so like I said, game one, pretty weak. I think our sideboarding is fairly straightforward. I think the way we had it makes sense, so I'm not really going to change it. We actually really haven't seen Aura Gnarled, but even still, I can't think of anything we want to play instead. I mean, maybe we play Gargoyle. I'm going to leave it in there just just in case I really don't want to have an aura gnarly get us so I, I mean we could have taken some different lines like block with the initial gargoyle but I don't think there was any way and then recur it back with the second one I don't think there was any way we were getting out of that game once he found trample and ancestral mask we were finished I mean the hexproof deck is more consistent now than it has been in the past. I mean, this guy's got Pilgrim, Commune with the Gods, that adds a lot of consistency to what auras he needs and what he can find. Commune with the Gods is just perfect because it gets you either the threat you need or the aura you need. And, uh, yeah, I mean, he's playing a lot of cantrips like Abundant Growth and Getaxian Probe, and we're just not liking this hand at all. So we saw the opponent get their first mulligan. This is, I believe, our second one. I think on average they're going to mulligan more than us. But we do play three colors. I think we're going to have to keep this one. Probably pitch any lands. And uh, if there's something like a journey on top, we're going to pitch that too. We'll keep basically a creature or a sideboard card, I think. Burn spell, not really interested in and he keeps seven that's a creature it's very slow uh, maybe we do bottom it maybe we're just going straight sideboard hate that's gonna take so long uh, we, we're not even getting that until turn uh, four basically so it's just way too slow okay so we're we're kinda behind here I mean already Koldo the Jess guy is just straight up looking like it's too slow at the moment but that's not to say that this match is over especially because he hasn't done anything yet um, but really that just means he's got he's got a three mana aura so it could divination here but we're almost like well on our way to hard casting the mole drifter so I was gonna say maybe we can get to rebirth there we have a kind of a clear line of play. It just I'm not sure if it's gonna line up with the which would be Prism next turn, Guildgate, and then Mole Drifter. But if he plays a significant number of auras, we may have to divination the Mole Drifter right away. And Utopia Sprawl also jumps him a turn uh, worth of tempo because it ramps him up just like he did here. Not only ramps him up, but makes his makes his uh, auras better. So I kind of feel like we can afford to wait a turn, but the Mole Drifter also doesn't really do anything as a creature for us. So I'm going to go ahead and just evoke it. We really just need to find sideboard hate, I'm, I'm thinking. And none of this is sideboard hate, so I'm going to go ahead and just gain some life and uh, see what happens. I mean, if he just has another mask, it's basically putting us on very very few 
turns to to find something. Okay, commune probably gonna get him something like ethereal armor. Nope, just either a growth or a bo boggle. It looks like I don't think he'd play a sprawl. Can't get the forest. Both he took the growth. Okay. So that's setting up all green auras for our potential leave no trace, but we'll see. Second commune, so he's probably taking that uh, cloak. Garden, sands. Yeah, he took the cloak. Boggle, scout. Okay, so we kind of know what's going, going down. Uh, we have some time here. I think I want to draw first. And then I'll probably end up playing the Core Sky Fisher at that point. Or I guess I could rebirth and draw. Seems reasonable. And we find another draw spell, so I'm just going to draw with it. Turns on Metal Craft. I could have played Core Sky Fisher to set up a block, but I'm not too interested in that. I think it's more important to try and find our sideboard. And also saving the Sky Fisher um, allows us to cast a free Patrician Scorn at some point if we draw it. So I don't think I'm going to block if he just attacks for 5, which it looks like that's what he's doing. He should probably draw off of the growth if he... Oh, never mind. Okay, so this really just puts us on have something or die. Uh, since we're not really blocking anytime soon, I, what I mean by that is not blocking for a kill anytime soon, I'm pretty sure we can just throw as much in front of him as possible. Now we just have to draw. I mean, I don't know what else we can do here. Alright, Daddy needs a new car. Let's see. Okay, that's pretty awful for us. Uh, I don't know that we're going to be able to block our way out of this. It's not awful for us because we might not be dead. <laughs> but we also might be. We have a lot of these life gain lands that might save us. I think five, unless he has another mask. I mean, we know he has these two, so that probably puts him over the top. 11, 13, 15, I think. Okay. Um, I'm just going to block with the highest toughness. And this, actually, you know what? I'm not going to block at all. Because if we end up blowing up all the auras, we're going to need blockers to kill with. And if he's saving the armadillo cloak, we're going to need both blockers. So. Okay, he's playing a bunch of guys. Uh, I think it's better to draw with two mana before we draw with three. And there's the leave no trace. So we can play Thraven Inspector. We're not going to block anywhere. And we're going to gain a life while we can. And we'll see how this goes. He's not likely to play any uh, more auras, but he might be tempted to. He might be tempted to because of all the blocks we have. Uh, well, I mean, we don't have it. I mean, on the ledge walkers, not just on that. Oh my God. What is the meaning of this? I don't know, but he must have like rap and vigor or something. 
Because this is a suicidal attack. I just don't understand. He's maybe giving away his whole board. Yeah. Wow. That was brutality. <laughs> Holy hell, that was rough. But he's also got the cloak. No, he doesn't. I must have looked wrong at what he has. So I don't think I want to use a burn spell. Think we're safe. Drawing. And, uh, wait a minute. Okay, we should be able to figure this out. His card is one of these, right? I'm going to assume it's Cloak. I don't know. He has one growth in the yard. I'm assuming he just played the growth at some point, And we just missed it. So I'll get in with Thraben Inspector. Um, it's possible I can even get in with the Glint Hawk and equip the Skyfisher, but I'll just get in with Thraben Inspector, I think. And he needs to, we need him to whiff on a few things so we can figure out what the hell is still in his hand. And then we'll go from there. He cast two commune with the gods. I thought the first one revealed... Okay, maybe he's... I don't understand. I'm, I'm kind of confused. Uh, maybe I can look at what he drew with the commune with the gods. So... Goblin... Okay, I think this is the first communion. He had an armadillo cloak off that. He caught he cast an abundant growth way late. Yeah, so he he has an armadillo cloak. So I think we can play let's play this first and draw and then we'll we'll go from there. I think we can attack with both of these guys, basically what I'm saying. He definitely has a cloak still. And it's looking like it's safe to cast that. We could almost get in the air if we wanted to. I think maybe that's what we do. I'm just going to casually play around Mana Tithe, even though it's kind of stupid, but... It, We've played so many tapped lands so far, I, I'm not too concerned about uh, messing up our sequencing, even though we just drew one. but Okay, so this is a lot of burn. This is 15 points. So we're not as far off as you might think. And we're leaving back flyers because of Silhana Ledgewalker. If that wasn't already clear. Okay, nothing from him. I'm not sure why he wouldn't play play the cloak. Uh, so I'm not sure how many blockers I need to leave back. I'm not going to leave that many back because we just have to kill him. If he has land and he goes cloak, mask... I mean, we can't beat that with a whole army of guys, so. We want to give him very few turns to draw that. I think that's all we can attack with at the moment. Maybe we don't need two flyers. I, no, we do because we need to kill a 3-3 three, three at, at, the, at the least. And he's just kind of striking out at the plate here. Ancient Den, I'm not... Okay, just keep attacking him. And we'll hold back on... Well, I guess it doesn't matter if we hold back on the Ancient Den or not. 
Okay, he's got something now. Ooh, Heliod's Pilgrim. So he's gonna get a mask. That's gonna make a guy a 7-7. Seven, seven. We do, we only have six points of flying power. I'm gonna have to equip a flyer. Okay, so keep that in mind. We're probably just bolting the Heliod's Pilgrim at some point. We don't have to do it now though. Yeah, so we have to equip a flyer to have seven. He can throw it on now, but it doesn't do anything. Man, he's setting us up for a kill, too. If he just has other auras. Okay, so he's got a Rancor. Um, so I guess I'm just never blocking, never attacking from here. That's a good draw. Let's do that now. Maybe I can find a Patrician Scorn or something. Wow, lots of burn. 16, 19. Um, so I think I get in with the Germ and equip something else. 3, 5, 7, 9. That gives me 9 points of flying power. I think we want that. Yeah, I, th I think we can only attack with the one guy. Plus he can block the inspector with impunity. He can double block. This is actually a crappy bl attack. He, he has a free block here, but fortunately for us he gets through. Just go ahead and do this. Sitting on all burn spells, but they do next to nothing right now. Three, five, seven, nine. Okay, I didn't get that wrong. So there's a few ways this can go. It's getting real interesting. So we know about these two things. And you can play them both in succession. Okay, we still know about these two things. I think we still live through this. Okay. So his last card is Cloak. I don't think he's going to want to attack us. Whoa. Okay. I thought wrong. Um. Alright. I guess we just put everything on it? No. We just put the two three threes on it. And he can... I guess he can kill both. Maybe we don't do that. Nine over five is four, putting us to one. Yeah, I think we have to do that. It's not looking great, but he does lose the ancestral mask, which is good. He keeps the Rancors. Yes. So something's got to happen good for us. Yes. Fortunately, our guys are big enough right now to stay alive. And we'll just hold. Definitely drawing. Okay. Keep that in our back pocket. Definitely equipping and not attacking anything. So this could lead to some good blocks for us. Especially since we're at one. <laughs> Being at one is kind of interesting. Okay, that's cool. I guess we just pass. We pass priority. <laughs> There's not a lot we can do here. I mean, we could start bolting the pilgrim and and getting in with these. Let me just play attack with one and before blocks bolt the pilgrim. 
Yeah, we need to start doing something. This game is taking way too long, and we, we're giving him way too many chances to, to get through, so... And anything that grants trample, we can we can do away with. We are at one. It's kind of sad. There's 16 points of burn. I kind of get the logic behind hold back my armadillo cloak because he's waiting to draw into something better. So I kind of get that. Um, hold back rather so that I don't just eat a leave no trace or patrician scorn. Looks like he might be going for it here. 7-3. So here we can just blow up his stuff and eat his guy. Which I think is preferred. Take his guy out to the cleaners. I'm not sure if that was a hundred percent what we wanted to do, but I don't think just blocking uh, was was the best either. Okay, journey doesn't do anything. I think we just attack with these two. He's clearly not going to block. Um, Ancestral mask I think kills us number three. Uh, Ancestral Mask. Ethereal Armor also is what? Five, six, seven, eight. I think we have to leave our guys back. Which sucks. I mean, I wish I wasn't at one. Alright, seven. Will he attack? No. All right, this is getting dangerous for us. Really dangerous. Relic of Progenitus, not a terrible draw at this moment. Okay. Uh-oh. Okay. Well, that's 16 points staring at you. And a journey to nowhere that does nothing. Oh no. He's got the mask. He's got it. I think that was the third one. And he's got another cloak. Wow. So, yep. Yeah, pretty bad. He, he actually fought through two copies of Leave No Trace. So that's pretty telling. Looking like he's pretty, uh pretty well set up here and I'm gonna do my best to not face this guy again so that you guys get a little more diversity so I'll try and wait a while and see if he somebody else joins a, a queue or whatever but anyway thank you guys very much for watching thanks to our opponent for playing and we'll see you for the final two men match alright guys that is all for this one Hey folks, Jason Moore here. We're playing round three. Well, rather, we're actually watching a replay of round three. I'm not sure what it is, but my round three videos keep getting plagued with uh, various technical difficulties. So we're just going to go and watch this replay real quick and kind of uh, talk you through what happened. I kept a seven-card hand, seven card hand on the play and led with the Swiftwater Cliffs. We're going to want to follow up with that prophetic prism there. We've got a nice mix of removal, creatures, draw, opponent appears to be affinity from the looks of things. So we're just going to head, go ahead and play Prophetic Prism. Uh, that's a fairly simple line. One thing about this deck, I'm just going to pause real quick, is that uh, we tend to get locked into certain lines. Now, that might be more my fault than anything, 
but uh, because of the creatures Clint Hawk and Core Skyfisher, which can slow our deck down significantly, uh, I'm really much more into playing the cantripping rocks or artifacts on turn two than I am doing uh, anything too aggressive. So we're leaving up Bolt here. The Atog is really big, but it's not big enough to kill right now. So I think we end up just taking the hit. Um, so here we're really in a desperate position, so I opt to use the divination to try and hit lands. So we don't hit lands, so we're going to have to pitch one of our three prophetic prisms. I actually decided to attack, which is uh, pretty bold. He's got 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, plus 4 is 15. So if he's got some extra artifacts on the on deck and maybe like a Galv Blast or something, we could be dead. So that ends up being exactly what happens, I think. He plays out three more artifacts, including his land for the turn. And he just starts busting up. His guy gets super big. And, you know, he's even got, he's got the Galv Blast, he's got everything, and he just goes all in on the Atog. That kills us. So, I mean, his opening draw was much stronger than ours. We played about, I think, three spells, and he played multiple creature threats, multiple uh, cantripping artifacts, and uh, it's debatable whether I should have attacked or not, but I think the plan was to try and stabilize with rebirth tokens on the ground. So uh, you can make an argument for blocking with Glint Hawk or not. Uh, kind of either way you slice it, I think. Let me know if you guys have any opinions one way or the other. So again, because it's a replay, I'm not going to be able to factor in a lot of how we sideboarded. But my general sideboarding for, um, okay, so this hand is a keep for affinity is to take away things that interact with small creatures and to try and bring in things that interact with large creatures. So we have obviously Journey to Nowhere and Galv Blast in this hand and those are both cards we're going to want to try and uh, win with. So we find Thraben Inspector, we go with that playing the Tapped Land and he just he has a slow draw which actually helps us out. We lead with our card draw don't really hit anything. We don't have Metalcraft yet. So now he has a Forger. Again, we don't have Metalcraft yet, but we're about to have it so we can establish it and then blast him and get in there. So that's what's happening. We're trying to, you know, get a bit of a... Uh... Okay, so I need to pause because a lot's happening right now. We need, we need to get a bit of a tempo advantage, but that just gets thrown right in our face because now he has Disciple with a Tog in play. So those are both creatures we need to deal with basically immediately. We do have Journey to Nowhere, which is a good thing. Um, and I have enough mana to do all of that on top of seeing a card. So I decide to I probably kill the... I guess I'm going for the Atog first. And I'm going to leave up the Galv Blast for now, just in case there's uh, something else I'd rather kill before we get to the Disciple. So I think here I'm actually going to kill the Disciple first, but we'll see. I might not do that. I'm at 22, so that's not necessarily the only option. And he has a Ray of Revelation. A Ray of Revelation. That is the best his Ray could possibly be against us here. He even has a Perilous Research to mitigate our galvanic blast and that ray of revelation is going to account for any subsequent journey to nowhere we can find so we start drawing cards and we play our all of our creatures are smaller than his it's not really a good look and that ray of revelation is crazy it's not actually going to be all that good against us except in a scenario like that where it's excellent so it's kind of strange we decide we have to block the Atog. He, he sacked a uh, artifact to kill the Thraben Inspector. He didn't actually need to sack it to keep the Atog alive, but as you can see, we're facing down three Atogs, 
and uh, there's just too much going on. He even has a gorilla shaman that's going to nuke our flare husk, um, and and nuke some of our lands. He's playing it a little bit safe. We can't, like I said, we can't even use this journey. We're gonna, I think we're gonna. Oh, I thought maybe we were gonna use it, um, and hope that he forgot about the ray of revelation. But we don't. We just play some guys, leave up mana, hope that he doesn't go all in. Three, five, seven, nine, eleven. Yeah, he has way too many artifacts, and there's really nothing we can do. So I decide not to block at all. Just hope he doesn't go for it. Of course he is going to, and that's gonna be it. I mean, we just got torched this match. We got torched pretty much every match. And I think the time for Koldotha Jeskai, at least uh, at the moment, has passed. It's not doing anything broken. It's not doing anything all that degenerate or or fast. It can't keep up with uh, the broken degenerate decks that are currently running around, running wild in the format. Um, we Again, we got smoked every single round. I think that's a real bad sign for this deck. I think it's time to really uh, focus our attention only on broken decks or really fast decks, really aggressive decks. That's kind of all you can do in the format right now if you want to keep up with the top strategies. All right, guys, sorry that this was another replay, but at least it saves you some time. This is Jason Moore signing off. I want to thank you very much for tuning in to this installment of... That's right. Dime a dozen.